Hey, this is Jared Cochran with Family Church. Welcome to our podcast. I'm excited that you're here. I hope that God moves through this message to reach you so he can move through your life. Be sure to share and subscribe so that we can reach the world with God's word. Enjoy the message. (laughs) This morning, welcome to Family Church. Let me say that. I don't do that enough. And I do want to say thank you to the praise team. Most of them. We had an extra song that I was going to try to throw out for this sermon today, but somebody got a little too scared of doing it at the last minute. I'm just kidding. We had some technical difficulties, but, uh, you know, we're going to work through it. We're going to work through it. And today, I'm going to give you all my title first. Today, I'm preaching on impossible faith. We were going to sing more than able, but he was less than able. So let's go. I'll get back on there. That'll take a lot less wind out of me than this will. No, uh, I'm going to be in Joshua 10. Uh, We're going to be talking about this little story, the sun stands still. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the story. Impossible faith. I want to talk to you today about impossible faith because we need need to get back to that. We need to get back to believing God for the things that he can do, not uh, the limits that we put on him with our tiny little imaginations. If we can rise for the reading of the word of God. I'm starting again, Joshua 10, verses 7 to 14. So Joshua marched up from Gilgal with his entire army, including all the best fighting men. The Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid of them. I have given them into your hand. Not one of them will be able to withstand you. And notice here. He speaks in the past tense. God speaks in the past tense to your problems because he has already passed whatever you are facing. The battle is already won. We like to think that we fight for victory, but when you're fighting with God, you're fighting from victory. You are just meeting him at the finish line. He has already won it. He is already in your tomorrow. He's at the end of your court date. He's at the end of your divorce. He's at the end of your addiction. Whatever it is you're facing, he's already there and won it for you. You just got to believe and meet him there. I'm fired up. Verse 9. After an all-night march from Gilgal, Joshua took them by surprise. The Lord threw them into confusion before Israel. So Joshua and the Israelites defeated them completely at Gibeon. Israel pursued them along the road going up to Beth Haran and cut them all the way from Azekah to Makeda. Woo, Macarena. That's hard to read. As they fled before Israel on the road down from Beth Haran to Azekah, the Lord hurled large hailstones down on them, and more of them died from the hail than were killed by the swords. <sighs> I know where this is going today. Oh, I'm, mm. y'all, y'all are in for it. The swords of the Israelites. On the day the Lord gave the Amorites over to Israel, Joshua said to the Lord in the presence of Israel, And if you heard this, you'd be like, that dude is out of his mind. But he said, sun stand still over Gibeon and you moon over the valley of Aijalon. So the sun sun stood still and the moon stopped till the nation avenged itself on its enemies. As it is written in the book of Jasher, the sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down about a full day. And at the time this was written, verse 14, there has never been a day like it before or since, a day when the Lord listened to a human being. Surely the Lord was fighting for Israel. And I'm wondering, not to get ahead, but back in verse 8, when he says, not one of them will be able to withstand you, if this is why Joshua prayed this prayer, the sun stand still. God, we thank you for the word. Use me as your vessel, Lord. I thank you for pouring this into me. And God, I pray that you awaken the the courage that is within us, the boldness that is within us that has been dormant and asleep for far too long. But I'm speaking in Jesus' name that it is not dead. It is not done. You will bring it back to the surface, God. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead can raise our awareness and raise our boldness again, God, to be like the days of Elijah and John the Baptist and like you, Jesus. God, have your way. Do not let your word return void. Amen. You can be seated. You can be seated. Tell your neighbor he is more than able. No, you can't sing it. You missed a chance. You missed a chance. 
You guys know who Mike Tyson is? Everybody should, especially the younger crowd now that thinks this Jake Paul guy is going to have any... If he wins, it's rigged, okay? Period. <laughs> you just, that should go without saying. Uh, but if you knew Mike Tyson or know him, uh, you know, he was uh, quite, a, quite an animal, quite a monster, I would say. He, uh, I don't remember his score. I should have written it down. It was like 54 wins or something. There was only like six losses, whatever it was. Phenomenal. Just a beast. And you would think, you know, that somebody like Mike would be completely fearless. Be unafraid and not afraid. I mean, you, if you look at the videos when he steps into the ring and stares at people, you would think, this guy is going to tear my face off and laugh while he's doing it. And you would think he would be unafraid, but uh, you would actually be completely wrong. Um, there's actually a video of him where he, would, he talked about he, how he would come out and he would, uh, he would say that he had supreme confidence, but he was scared to death. He had supreme confidence but he was scared to death. He said he was totally afraid of everything. Afraid of losing, afraid of being humiliated, but he was totally confident. As soon as he stepped into the ring, no one could beat him. That was his words. That is the mentality that he had. He was afraid, but he was confident. Or he was scared, I want to say. And he was confident. But today we're talking about Joshua. And I'm going to go out on a limb and say Joshua is the original Mike Tyson. Joshua had this going on well before Mike was in the ring. Joshua, he had that dog, that fight in him. He had the dog in him. And that is why we still talk about his feats, the things that he has accomplished, and not his fears. He had any number of reasons to feel feel fears, and we're going to get into that in a minute, but he had supreme confidence like that. Like Mike Tyson, he had supreme confidence because he operated from knowing that he was already chosen and knowing that God was fighting for him. So he had the confidence in his creator. He already knew beforehand. Because in Joshua 1, he was told, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. I love this quote by Mark Twain. He said, Courage is not the absence of fear, but the mastery of it. And Kelsey actually the other day on the church page, she made this post about um, courage and fears. Now, I don't know if you saw it, but she wrote down that fear is not a choice. And it's not. You can't choose to not feel fear. If you do, let us know. Raise your hand. And we will call the hospital and Baker after you because you are a psychopath. Um, you can't choose to not feel fear. You can still feel fear. You can't absolutely just have no fear. It's a choice. Or it's not a choice, excuse me. And she went on to say that courage, courage is a choice. Courage is a choice. And I don't want to call her out. She's my wife and I love her. But I do think it's a little bit incomplete. Because yes, we have to choose to be courageous. We have to choose to go out and step out in faith. We have to make the choice to be courageous to talk to those around us that need to hear about Jesus. We have to come up here and courage and step out in faith to talk to you all knowing that we will be judged greater by what we say in front of you, especially not just the internet, but God. That's the one that's more important than whatever the internet has to say. We have to choose to step out of faith. We have to choose to follow God even into the darkest places imaginable just to shine a little bit of light. Because we will never know our potential under God until we step out and take risks on the front line of battle. But... If you don't know, I skipped the first part of the verse, and it's not on the screen. Joshua 1.9, it doesn't just say, be strong and courageous. The first part of the verse says, have I not commanded you? Courage is not just a choice. Courage is a commandment. Courage is having having supreme confidence in your creator. Courage is knowing that no matter what God is calling you to, or calling you to face, or calling you to go through, he is already there. Your battle is already won. That's why he speaks about it in the past tense. You don't have to keep fighting about it. You don't have to keep fretting over it and having fear of it. You don't need to be afraid of it. You need to have supreme confidence about God in your situation, because being afraid is what paralyzes you. I don't know if you have ever heard of this before, but the fight or flight response. The fight or flight response. One will choose you to punch somebody in the mouth, and the other will make you run away from a situation. 
both, I believe, both or are some form of self-preservation in a way. You can yeah. defend yourself or you can run trying to save yourself. You can defend yourself or you can run trying to save yourself. Fight or flight, they're both self-preservation. One's just for cowards. <clears throat> and if you look at David and Goliath, he didn't cower in fear from Goliath. When Goliath talked about how big he was, he talked about how big God is. And he ran towards Goliath. He didn't even walk to him. He ran towards him, a boy, to a giant that was anywhere from 9 to 13 feet tall. But fight or flight, I believe there is a third option, and that is being afraid. Not feeling afraid, being afraid. Being afraid is not fight or flight. It's being frozen. It's being paralyzed. Because being scared is a temporary rush of your feelings. You get the adrenaline rush to do something that can move you to action, but being afraid is a state of being. Scared is a temporary rush of feelings, and being afraid is a state of being. Like I said, one will move you to action, the other will move you into apathy. And Tyson's trainer, I'm not even going to try to say his name because I'll mess it up, he said, the hero and the coward both feel the same thing, but the hero uses his fear, projects it onto his opponent, and while the coward runs. It's the same thing, fear, but it's what you do with it that matters. I have a, a book at home, and it's not a Christian book, it's a, a fiction book, but there's a, in the, before the first chapter, chapter there's a, a quote in there, and I wish I wrote down who said it, but it said um, something about bravery is we, we, we feel, you know, we get scared or we have courage, the hero feels fear. He's just braver for five minutes longer. Right. He's braver for five minutes longer. That's what it was. So don't let fear control you. You need to learn how to control it and let it fuel your courage because God tells us we're not given a spirit of fear. Right. We're commanded, though, to have courage. Right. And Joshua had a lot of reasons to feel fear because Joshua was born into slavery in Egypt when they were in Egypt for the 400 years. He was born into slavery. So that's all he knew. And then Moses comes along, and we know he has, with God, he has the plagues, and he brings them out and he rescues them. And then when they first get close to the promised land, if you remember, there was 12 spies that went out. And Joshua and Caleb were the only two that had the courage to see that it was good land. They had the courage to trust God and believe. The other two were scared of the situation, and they thought that it was too risky. They couldn't do it. They stopped believing, they got too afraid, and they froze. But Joshua and Caleb, they saw that it wasn't big problems. It was big provision. It was big blessings. It was a big purpose. And I know today you've got big problems. You've got a scary situation, but you have a bigger God and the Savior of the world behind you, in it with you, and before you. He will send you into places to trust him more and more and to flex your faith. Do not forget the power that is within you. The same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead lives within us. Amen. Don't forget that because the Israelites had forgotten. They had already forgotten at that point what God had done. And if you notice a lot in scripture, when somebody needs God to show up, they'll start recounting to God. Remember, Lord, how you brought our people out. Remember how you did this for us. Remember how you did this for us. And they tell God all that he has done before for them, especially when they need him to show up. For them. So when you don't know what else to do, remind God of what he has already done before, not because he needs to remember, but because you need to remember. You need to remember that he is faithful, faithful, that he is just, that he loves you, that he is in it with you, fighting for you, working through you. God is not against you. But they listened to the wrong people, as we know. They listened to the 10 instead of the two, and they got off track for 40 years. And I don't know if any of you have ever followed the wrong person. Uh, I texted him today, and I know he's not here. He's probably not watching. I have this buddy, Dale, and I used to work with him um, in line work. And this dude will tell you that if he doesn't have a GPS, he's getting lost as soon as he leaves his driveway. So horrible situation to try to follow him because he has absolutely no idea where he is going, but he will have the confidence to just play it off. You, it's like one of those guys that he's so good at being sarcastic and lying that you just don't know if he's telling the truth. And sometimes it's hilarious, and the other times it wants to put in your, your fight response. Um, so we were out in Flagler Estates, and I don't know if you've ever been there, but that's where you go to get lost and die. And 
There's no, there's no cell phone signal. There's turns that make no sense. And we were doing a, uh, a job out there, strengthening the lines and stuff for hurricanes. And uh, we had already been there for a couple months. And we get to this one spot where we, we literally needed to come up, turn right, make a left, and drive for about two minutes, and we would be at the next spot. Well, this dude left before us, before me, because typical foreman, they just rip out and you have no idea where they go. And then they show up like 30 minutes later with cheeseburgers. But so he goes to leave and he's in front of me and I see him pause at the stop sign. So I know this joker has no idea where he's trying to go. So I'm like sitting there behind him flickering the lights, you know, hey, hopefully you see this in your mirror. And I'm like turning on my blinker to go to the right, go to the right, go to the right, make sure you go to the right. Dude goes straight left. And me being a nice, decent person at the time, I was like, well, he's going to get lost if I don't go help him. So I followed him and we ended up getting lost together. And we drove around (laughs) for about 20 minutes instead of driving around for about three minutes. But I know that I should have known better than to follow him. Just like the Israelites should have known better than to follow the wrong people. So they spent 40 years wandering around the desert until the generation dies out and Moses dies out. And now it's Joshua's turn to take over. Joshua is, a, oh, I love this. Joshua is about to take them from drifters to dwellers. He is about to take them from being stragglers into being settlers. They're going to go from roamers to residents. Joshua is the one that is going to start taking them from vagrancy into victory. Mm, I'm more excited about that than y'all are. Y'all, it, you know, it's too white in this church. Y'all have not been to enough places that have had like 35 minute praise breaks and you don't know when church is going to end. I, yes, she's nodding back there. She knows. Mm, we got to get, yes, we need some more Jesus in here. Joshua did not let a bad, <laughs> a bad situation make him, I got to get back on track. Joshua didn't let a bad situation make him bitter because he had the, 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 the faith and the courage to believe God and to moving them into the promised land, two of them out of everybody. And instead they get stuck listening with the majority and they could have, Joshua could have been really bitter about this. He could have been like, man, we're supposed to be there. Why is it taking this long? Look what y'all did and gotten angry at everybody. He could have even just been like some of us. And because the blessing got placed on hold, we started to turn our back on God. But he chose to trust God and follow God further because he always knew what God could do. He remembers the miracles coming out of Egypt because Joshua was the one to fight the battle against the Amalekites. This is Exodus 17. So while they're fighting the Amalekites at Rephidim, and this is, you know, know, no, Rephidim. I'll cut that out. And while they're fighting, Moses is up on a hill with Aaron and her. And as long as he raises his hands, they will win the fight. But the minute he starts getting tired, they begin to lose. And I want to preach this sometime. I'll call it the, the posture of praise because we need to maintain a posture of praise because as long as we stay submitted to God and living our lives in worship to him, he will fight for us and strengthen us in our battles. But when we lose focus and we start to get too exhausted to even be enthusiastic about our Savior, the enemy will make us suffer more. And notice this. They won because Moses had friends to help him maintain it. They brought him a stone to sit down on, and it got to the point that they held his arms up. Who you have to back you up in your fight matters just as much as you following God into battle. That is why, that is why it is important to surround yourself with godly people who are firm in their faith, and in some cases more firm in their faith than you are, so they will help build you up. All these people that think that church is just the body and you don't need to come into the building are wrong because we're supposed to meet together and encourage one another and empower one another and build each other up to follow God and go out into the world and do the work that he has commanded us to do. So Joshua overcomes that army. And and I love the ending of Exodus 17. He says, because hands were lifted up against the throne of the Lord, the Lord would be at war with them. Mm. If you want to attack God, you're going to lose. I'll just leave it there. So after that, they come to Jericho, the first place when they start getting into Canaan. They march around once a day for six days, and they have to be quiet because they've already been wandering around because of their mouths, and sometimes you need to just shut up and watch what God can do. Sometimes you need to just shut up and watch what God can do. So they march around once 
a day for six days. And on the seventh day, they march around seven times. Then they blow, boom, trumpets, everything falls down. Rahab's family gets saved. Side note, I don't know what Mission Impossible stuff the spies did to get in there. I really want to know. They give us no tea, no details. And it's just like, hey, the spies are in Rahab's house. How? Let me know, because I want to know. That make it's good. So we get to Joshua 10. Joshua 10. The sun stands still prayer chapter. And this whole fight began in chapter 9 because the Gibeonites who lived in Canaan, they were one of the enemies. They deceived Joshua into making a treaty with them. And this literally goes against the commandment of God to wipe out the people in Canaan. And I understand that's a really hard thing to wrap your head around. But if you don't remember, in Deuteronomy 20, verse 10, what they're supposed, what they're supposed to first do, my southern was coming out, they're supposed to, First, extend peace to the people. Extend peace to the people. And right here, I could start, oh, you know, we need to quit bashing people and judging people. I think I've yelled at that enough with y'all. They're supposed to extend peace to the people first. And if the people accepted the terms, just like nowadays, they would be absorbed into Israel, absorbed into the body of Christ, and they would be subservient to the Israelites. They would be working for God's kingdom. But if they rejected it, they were to be killed in judgment for their sins. I think you can see the connection with how if you accept God, you get to live with God forever. If you don't, you get to live apart from him forever. You will have an eternal body. It's your choice which one you're going to have. So they were actually given around 400 years for repentance. Uh, This was spoken to Abram, Abram, excuse me, in Genesis. He wasn't even Abraham yet. God warns him about it. And instead, the entire land of Canaan up until now has been practicing incest, homosexuality, bestiality, gross, and child sacrifice. Those are all terrible, disgusting things. And at this point, they have heard all that the Israelites have been doing, how the Israelites are already starting to conquer their land and come in. They have no idea what's going on because no matter what they throw at them, God does it in just the weirdest ways because he wants to make sure people know it's from him. And they've been seeing this since Joshua 2. But the Gibeonites decided to deceive their way into their deliverance. And let me tell you this. You do not need to lie about who you are or what you have done or what you did last night when you come to Jesus. You don't have to get clean first when you come to Christ. He will do it for you. Your new beliefs will not immediately stop your old habits. You are supposed to repent and turn away from your sins, yes, and Jesus will clean you up in the process, yes. but sanctification is a lifelong process. Yes. Amen. It is lifelong. And the Gibeonites, they deceived their way into their deliverance. They used moldy bread and old clothes to act like they lived far away outside of Canaan, so they would be a little less harsh on them. And Joshua doesn't consult God, he just immediately makes a treaty with them. And then they find out three days later, And instead of going back on their terms and killing them, they decide to stand true to their word. They already made the treaty. They're going to stand by it. When we fail to consult God and lean on our own understanding, we will always make a bigger mess. But God will use your mess in order to send a message to those around you. The sun and the moon stopping in this is God sending a message, not of just what he can do, but that he is the only God because the Canaanites worshiped false gods that were represented by the sun and the moon. So God is literally showing them, I'm the only one that can do this and your little puny, pathetic little worm gods have nothing that can come against me. God stops it. God stops it. And now there's five kings that come from the surrounding area and they hear about it and they wanna kill the Gibeonites for joining with their enemy. And in one of the uh, commentaries I read, he said, when sinners leave the service of Satan and the friendship of the world in order to follow God and serve him, they shouldn't be surprised when they begin to be hated. Their former friends have now become their foes. Satan will try to convince you to reject the cross simply because you don't want to be rejected by your friends or your coworkers or your family. 
And the people that are just starting to follow Jesus and just starting to come to church, just starting to read their Bible, and just starting to walk with God should be protected just as much as those who have been in here their entire life, who have been faithful to him for years. Because once you are in the kingdom, you are part of the family. We are all children of God. None of us are any better than the other one. It's all an even playing field. And once you are here, it is our duty to defend you. It is our duty to defend the afflicted, to defend the broken, to defend the lost who are like the Gibeonites and wanting to come to God for the sake of the gospel. The Gibeonites were in that situation simply because they wanted to have a different life. They were starting to make a change in their life. And these kings surround them and they send word, the Gibeonites send word to Joshua looking for help. And that is where we have picked up in chapter 7. So Joshua marches up from Gilgal with his entire army. All night, he doesn't wait. He immediately goes into action. He's not like, I need to consult the board of the elders. We need to have a church vote. We need to decide what to do. Are we allowed to do this? Is there finances in the bank? Are they going to give enough to this cause? No, Joshua consults with God this time. That's why it says the Lord told him, do not be afraid. And he immediately goes out. He immediately goes out and he already knows now because of God that the battle is already won. He doesn't know how it's going to happen. He doesn't know when it's going to get won. He doesn't know anything other than the facts that God does and always will stand true to his word to him and to you. If he said it, he will do it. If he started it, he will finish it. He is the God of the promise that he will never break. You can stay scared of a situation and stay stuck in it, or you can realize that all your situation needs is one single word spoken from God into it, the breath of life of God into it. All he needs to do is meet you in your faith. God is able to do it if you will just believe he will do it. And it might be different than you imagined. It might be longer than you imagined. And it won't be as easy as you imagined. I don't know if any church has told you that the Christian walk is going to be easy. No, it's going to be harder than going on your own path and following the world in whatever way you want to do. Narrow is the gate. Narrow. Woo. There ain't nobody guarding the gates to hell because you can just walk right in. And this life won't be easy. And Joshua in this battle didn't have it easy. He marches all night uphill. I read it was somewhere around 20 miles, anywhere from 20 to 26 miles overnight. The journey was said to usually take about three days. I don't know if y'all like me. I'm not running for two minutes. And he didn't rest when he got there. He got immediately to work. After marching all night, they immediately begin fighting. And the enemy tries to flee. But while they're fleeing, God sends a hailstorm that kills more of them than the Israelite swords did. Because while you're working, God is working. While you're working, God is working. Whatever you do, God is already doing more because he is faithful to you being faithful. When you're praying, he is providing. He's making a way for you to get through it. You just have to keep pushing He wants you to keep following him. They had to have been exhausted. And they still pursued him. 20 miles. And I'm thinking, because you can't just read the Bible. It'd be boring if you just read the Bible. That's why it's boring. If you think it's boring, because you're just reading it. You got no imagination. You have to realize this. They, They marched all night. So they are tired. And they have immediately gotten into work. And they didn't stop. So maybe they're starting to fall behind. They're starting to drag behind a little bit. They're trying to keep up. And maybe they're slowly falling farther and farther away. And you could be like them. You can be upset at losing ground, thinking that they're losing, looking like they're losing, looking like the enemy was slipping away from them and they wouldn't be able to reach it because they know that they're supposed to destroy all of them completely. So they're seeing them slip away and they're thinking maybe these guys are going to reach another city. Maybe they're going to find another king and they're going to have more forces and this is going to be terrible. Mm. But instead... As they're falling away, God lets their distance be their deliverance. God lets their distance be their deliverance. Because when hail started raining down and killing the enemy, none of God's people were involved in that. They were nowhere near it. 
And maybe you're trying way too hard to keep fighting. And you're trying too hard to stay too close to your fight. And all God really wants you to do is get close enough to the battlefield so you can watch him do the work. Maybe God wants you to stop trusting on your own understanding. Stop trusting what you can hold in your own hands. And let go. Let God. Trust in him. And instead of continuing and trying to hold on to things, he wants you to let go of it. He wants you to trust him and watch him do it. Maybe it only looks like you're losing right now because God is setting you up for something else to deliver you from. To deliver you. And now the sun is going down. You've been at it all day and they've been at it all day long. And the sun is going down. But he can't let them get away. He is committed to this. He is going to see it through. The job is not finished. He is not going to let darkness give them cover. And he prays a bold prayer. A bold prayer. And you need to start saying bold prayers again. I mean, look at this. Verse 12. Sun stands still over Gibeon. And you moon over the valley of Aijalon. So the sun stood still and the moon stopped. That makes no sense. No sense. I have read so much this week while studying this that there's all these debates on how this happened. Was it real? Was it a metaphor? Could God even do this? Oh, it's not possible because he he would have had to stop the rotation of the earth. And if he did that, then it would have to start back up and everything would fly around. This makes no sense. It's not supposed to make sense. It's a miracle. I don't understand. I don't understand. People are like, oh, how could he do that? Are you kidding me? He spoke everything into existence. Every single thing. He is the one that created the sun and the moon. And you think he can't stop it? He sent his son. He came down to be God in the flesh and raised himself up. But more the sun. No way. That's too much. We have debates and fights over the absolute stupidest thing. Instead of just reeling like, wow, Bible's true. God said it. Woo. We're going to get up there and realize that we have had so much wrong. And he's just been sitting up there with his face in his palms. Like, y'all are so dumb. <laughs> this makes no sense. And your situation probably doesn't make sense right now. Your lost loved one doesn't make any sense. The car accident doesn't make any sense. Your drawn out fight doesn't make any sense. The shame that you feel doesn't make any sense. Your lost reputation, your lost job, your child that you found is on drugs now because you went through their drawers. The affair that is in your marriage, the cancer that is killing your body, none of it makes sense. It doesn't make sense. And we keep trying to make sense of a God whose ways are not our ways and his ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts. God uses the foolish foolish to shame the wise. And so I say when we step back and realize that we can know God, but we're never going to fully know him on this side of heaven, we can quit limiting him to our imagination of what makes sense. This had not been done before. The sun had not stopped before. God had already done great things. He had already flooded the, created the earth. Let's just start there. Created Adam and Eve, created us. He flooded the earth. He parted the Red Sea and he parted the Jordan. He made people yell and the walls came down. None of y'all's house has done that in the arguments that you have with your wife. It's never been done before. God is not limited to our, I I'm going to give you today. God is not limited to our imagination. He is not bound to our beliefs. He's not bound to what you think he's supposed to do, how he's supposed to do it. He's not bound to how he thinks a church is, how you think, I'm sorry, a church is supposed to look or operate, how it's supposed to act, how the worship is supposed to sound, how the music's supposed to sound, how they're supposed to sing a song, how they're supposed to play the instrument, if they're even supposed to have drums or if it's all supposed to be bongos and rain sticks. God is not bound to what we believe about him because when he is ready to step in and rescue you, there is nothing that is going to stand against him. There is no height. There is no depth. There is no devil. 
in hell. There is no man and no government. Nothing can stop the Redeemer from rescuing you. There are no roadblocks for the Redeemer. And there were no roadblocks to Joshua's belief in God. He was bold enough to pray this. He knew the task. God had already told them, I've given them to you. None of them can withstand you. But the job wasn't finished. God had already showed up and killed more of them than they had. But the job wasn't finished. The sun was setting, but the fight wasn't finished. There was nothing that was going to stop Joshua at this moment from finishing the job. And he could have easily been like, well, the sun's going down. Let's call it 10 and take it in. Pack it up. We are done. No, instead of coming up with an excuse, he looked to God for empowerment. Instead of giving a God a reason, giving God the reason why they had to quit, he asked God to help them continue. And I don't, I don't understand why we get so hung up on that hasn't been done before. We keep putting our limits on God's limitless abilities. He can do whatever he wants, more than you ask, think, or imagine. Everything he can do can exceed anything that your tiny pea-sized and my tiny little pea-sized brain can think of. But we can't get past our tiny little imaginations. He is more immense than our ignorance. You will, tr- <laughs> you will trust him with your eternal soul, but not your entire situation. You will trust him with your eternal soul to save you from death, hell, and the grave. But there is no way he's making gas get in my tank tonight so I can get to work in the morning. (laughs) Joshua didn't get an easy fix. He had to fight longer. He had to stay in the fight longer. He had to keep chasing after it. He had to keep chasing the enemy. Joshua set his heart to obey God, and God did not give him an immediate victory. He lengthened the day. We want a quick fix in short-term results, but God is focused on your long-term faith. He wants your long-term commitment. We want the fast food faith. God says, I made you a table, but it ain't where you think it is. Guess what? It's in the presence of your enemies. So go ahead and sit down and have a little eat because I've already prepared the meal and they're going to have to stand there and watch you eat, baby. No matter what you do, they can't attack you. They can't come against you. They're going to get loud, but they're going to be on the sidelines. And the only thing that you can do from the sidelines is scream. But they're going to have to watch you eat. So sit down, trust God, and watch your cup run right over. The purpose is not a quick fix. The purpose is a sharper focus, a sharper faith, a fixed focus on God. Instead of God wiping them out, they had to continue the fight and continue to trust him even longer in this process. He granted an an impossible task, impossible faith, to make the sun stand still, just to show that the battle is only ever possible through him, with him. We can trust God and we can praise him even longer when his answer is no or his yes looks different than what we imagined, what we prefer, because we aren't after his answers. We're after him, just him. The purpose is to get you to trust God more with your battle, with your burden, with your finances, with your family, with your job, with your joy, with your fears, and your faith. God wants you to trust him with all that you have, all that you are. His praise should continually be on your mouth. What has happened to faith that believes God for the impossible? Calling on the sun to stand still. Calling for cancer to be canceled out of someone's body. Calling for tumors to shrink. For the lame to walk. Y'all remember the song, Too Good to Not Believe? For some of y'all, it's not good enough to believe. That sounded way more harsh than I intended. (laughs) When we went to first play that song, in one of the versions, versions, I said that right? Versions. Wrong religion. Uh, <laughs> in one of the versions, they, he says, uh, I've seen metal plates dissolve. I'm going to go there. I'm not scared. I was, I was debating it. Uh, some people who remain unnamed and no longer attend here, they said that we couldn't sing that line because they had never seen it happen. 
A lack of faith. Exactly. A lack of faith. I don't care if you haven't seen it. I haven't seen it. But just because I haven't seen it doesn't mean I can't speak it and call it into existence and believe it in faith. You haven't seen the metal plate dissolve probably because you don't believe it can. That's exactly right. I've already said it. You, you have placed your faith in Jesus and believed that he has overcame death, hell, and the grave. Why does our faith stop right there? Why does it not keep moving forward? Why is it not believing God for more? Jesus said greater works we would do and more. We're not supposed to stop. When Jesus ascended into heaven, his followers were only in the hundreds. And 40 days later, 40, 4, 0, in response to the preaching of the apostles, that number jumped into the thousands. Church is not supposed to stay small. If it is, it's dead. God ain't there. You're wondering if he was going to show up and he's like, I didn't even know that place existed because I've never been there before. If it's not growing, it's not alive. God is powerful enough to perform if there are Christians bold enough to believe. Write that one down. Put it on your fridge, on your mirror, and and remind yourself every single day. He is powerful enough to perform if you are bold enough to believe because he will manifest himself in direct proportion to your passion for him. So what happened? Why did we stop asking him for the sun to stand still? Because we got familiar with our faith. Right. We got familiar with it, and it no longer excited us. Right. Right. That's right. We're just bored. It became routine. The southern thing to do, go to church on Sunday or just be a creaster and come on Christmas and Easter. <laughs> and day in and day out, y'all laughing, but you know it's true. A creaster, a creaster Christian. I did not come up with that, so don't attribute it to me. Day in and day out, little devotion here, little devotion there. Oh, I missed today. Oh, I missed tomorrow. And suddenly we have found ourselves to be the lukewarm church that Jesus wants to vomit out of his mouth because he would rather us be either completely hot or completely cold. There is zero middle ground. You are either steadily pushing towards God or you are steadily falling away from God. There is no coasting. There's no swimming around on the surface. Jesus is the well that never runs dry and we need to stop being content with just skimming across on the surface and jumping back out to get dry and jumping back in to skim the surface. No, there is no ending to the bottom of his well. We need to go deeper and find that it never ends. The world is a dry pit of despair, and only God can deliver us from it. What happened to waking up every single day thankful for the breath that is in your lungs? When is the last time that you thanked God for your ability just to see or hear or walk or have a memory? They have all become routine because instead we have taken it for granted and we have stopped remembering that everything we have is a gift from God. We should be reaching so many people that Christ is commonplace, that he is everywhere. But our faith, hear me, church, our faith should never be commonplace because we need an uncommon faith. We need a bold faith. We need a faith like Joshua that stays battle ready, a faith that moves mountains, a faith that shakes the prison gates and the walls surrounding them, faith that breaks the chains off. I don't know why y'all are so quiet because you must have a lack of faith. We need faith that heals the blind, raises the dead, makes those who can't walk to run out of a building dancing. God may not be physic- now, God may not physically make the sun stand still in your life, but I'm still going to stand by him in faith. I'm going to stand firm in his foundation on Christ, the solid rock. I will ask him to strengthen me, to make me bolder, to make me have more fire. Ask for your day to be longer so you can trust him deeper. You don't need your battle swept under the rug. You need the grace and the glory, the glory and the gifts of God to come rushing in and sweep you off of your feet. 
You need him to meet your audacious faith with his awesome power. I don't think God wants pity party prayers anymore. I don't think he's just satisfied with Jesus be with me today and thank you for my mac and cheese and my McNuggets. Amen. He is ready for his believers to believe and become warriors again. You are called more than a conqueror. And guess what? That means you're already a conqueror. So why did we stop conquering? Why did we stop taking things back from the gates of hell? Why are we letting the enemy completely flood our schools and our media and our justice departments and every single thing in this country instead of standing up and saying, God, yes, hell, no. God is ready for your bold prayers. Whatever you ask, think, or imagine, according to his will, prayers. Stop asking him to just get you out of it. It says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. It does not say, yea, that I was airlifted out of the shadow of the valley of death. It doesn't say, yea, though I was Ubered out of the shadow of the valley of death. It doesn't even say, yea, though I ran through the valley of the shadow of the death. It said, I walk and you are with me. have to walk through it but he is still with you the entire way if you think he's not you're looking in the wrong direction when the enemy wants to come against you you have got to stand taller you need to stand firmer in your faith your situation is probably taking longer than you have imagined and hoped for but God is stretching your faith for success Faith does not stretch in comfortable places. It stretches in the chaos. You pray for patience. God is going to send you small children or puppies that will test your patience. It doesn't grow in complacency. And do you know why? Do you know why faith doesn't grow in complacency? Y'all can talk. This is, this is, (laughs) this is not Baptist. Because it doesn't have to. It doesn't have to. It will not stretch. It will not grow in complacency because it doesn't have to. If you have got nothing to believe God for and nowhere for God to step into, what is the point of your faith? Because faith does not stop. Your faith does not stop unless you do. And you are not stuck unless you stop. You have to keep moving forward. You have to keep moving forward. And if the size, if if the vision doesn't scare you that God has for your life, at least a little bit, it's probably not big enough. That's a good word, preacher! One of the greatest quotes that I love from Stephen Furtick says, if the size of your vision for your life isn't intimidating to you, there's a good chance it's insulting to God. We need bigger faith, bolder faith, battle-ready faith. Not fast food faith. I don't care about your cheeseburger and your McNuggets. How is God going to deliver your kid from drugs? How is God going to deliver you from needing validation from everyone on your social media? How is God going to get the cancer out of your body if you're too scared to ask him to do it? How is he going to show up and save your marriage that you won't get on your knees and pray to him about it for? How is he going to step into your situation if you are too scared to speak to him about it? Or to someone else about it. And gets two or three people. A three-quarter strand. Mm. We need faith that does not quit when the sun goes down. Faith that asks God to make it stand still because the job is not finished. We need faith that says, I am stepping into this ring and I'm scared. I am a little bit afraid, but I have supreme confidence in my Savior. In my Creator. This book, Jim Cimbala wrote it. Fresh wind, fresh fire. Go get it. Written in the 90s. You're going to think it was written today. Uh, Pastor of the Brooklyn Tabernacle in New York, I guess, because Brooklyn. Um, These people, let me read you the first quote. Oh, this is beautiful. 
And you've probably heard my dad say it before. He said, I despaired at the thought that my life might slip by without seeing God show himself mightily on our behalf about his church. He goes on to say, I would rather die than merely tread water throughout my career in the ministry, always preaching about the power of the word and the spirit, but never seeing it. I abhorred the thought of just having more church services. I hungered for God to break through in our lives, in our ministry. They were in our, I don't know if they still are, because this was the 90s, in a terrible area, an area that is surrounded with drugs and prostitution, transvestites, all that fun, nasty stuff that the world says is great. Uh, They have now gotten to the point where they have made prayer such an important part of their church that people come in shifts of up to three hours or longer, I guess, if they like, and 24 hours a day, seven days a week, somebody is in that building praying. As the pastor is up standing and preaching, they are praying in a different room. They do not stop. What has happened to that kind of faith that believes for the impossible? Because God doesn't want your what ifs. What if this doesn't work? What if he doesn't show up? What if my mom dies? What if my husband leaves me? My wife leaves me? What if I fail my school? He doesn't enjoy your fears. He is pleased by your faith. Hebrews 11.6. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. I don't know if y'all have noticed this, but I start to stutter sometimes when my brain gets going a little bit faster than my mouth does. If you've ever been in the situation where your mouth mouth has moved a little bit faster than it should have and it wrote the check that you can't cash type of situation because your mouth moved faster than your brain did and it put you in a situation that you never should have been in because of our mouth. But I believe God is looking for the ones whose faith moves faster than their brain does, whose faith doesn't think of all the what ifs in the bad sense. They think, what if he does show up? Because they know... He is looking for the ones who know he does. Not if, what if. He does. He is looking for the ones whose faith moves faster than their brain does. Whose faith moves faster than their mouth can stop. Whose faith moves faster than they can think and they just begin to act in the Holy Spirit and begin to pray. Whose prayers move farther than their pain does. Whose prayers move farther than their past wants to let them. Their prayers that will move mountains, that will activate the wonders of the living God who is still looking for those who aren't just afraid of the impossible. They're unafraid of the impossible. Those who are bold enough to believe that, that, to dare God to do it. God, I dare you to show up in my situation. I dare you to move in this place. I dare you to show up so fast and so ferociously that the fire in your word will be uncontained and the world can't help but take notice. And I am not challenging God to do it. I'm challenging me and you to believe that he can and he will do it. God wants you to still move mountains, to still pray to stop the sun. He wants you to show the sun stand still faith and to give you the strength to finish your fight. Y'all can, if they can get the kids for the thing, I'm almost done. God wants to move your mountains. And I'm praying, Lord, move my mountain. Move my mountain. Give us the bold faith again. Move my heart. Let my faith invite you in deeper and further into my life like never before. Move our hearts, God. Make us believe again to chase the impossible because we are so complacent and apathetic and asleep. We have got to stop having boring churches and we need to have burning churches. And I know... In Joshua, when it was written, there was not a day uh, at that time. 
that was similar, where the sun stood still. But there was another day that something similar happened further in the future. And that is the day that Jesus died on the cross for your sins. The sky turned black. It was dark. He became sin so that we can live without sin. He died for us to have repentance, to turn away from our sins, to recognize his sacrifice for our lives. And in a moment, we are going to dedicate these kids, but I want you to have the chance today, each and every one of us in this building, to pray for your salvation. And I don't know if you've prayed it before. If you want to pray it again, I, I'd like everybody to say it all at once so nobody feels left out. And I say it every time, it's not a magical prayer, because it's not. It's not a get out of hell free card. Do not pass go, do not collect $200 kind of thing. That's not what this is. It is a chance for you to live out how the Bible says, if you trust God and believe in your heart and say it with your mouth. And as they come out, if we can, if everybody will bow your heads really quick. We'll see, repeat after me. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, I thank you that you sent your son who died for my sins. I thank you, Lord, that you rose him again to defeat death, hell, and the grave. Thank you, Lord, for my eternal life because it starts in you. Jesus, I will follow you all of my days. Amen. If that is your first time, there is a party in heaven going right along for you. Hey, I hope that message spoke to you today. I want to say thank you to everybody who is involved at Family Church and those who help support this ministry. If you would like to get more involved, you can click the link in the description or head to our website, familychurch.social. We would love to connect with you, and you can find all of our social media platforms on our website. Also, if this message spoke to you in any way today and you liked it, consider sharing it on your social media in any way that you would like so that we can help reach those far from God and return them to the arms of the Father. We want to see God work through you. We love you. Thanks again for listening. God bless you.